it's really a great honor for me, and I guess it's also a great luck <laughs> that I'm here <laughs> uh, and able to speak to you. And uh, unfortunately, our, many of our just Viennese colleagues could not come. I don't know whether that will change the next days, but I don't think so. So you have to take me. And I will speak about neutron interferometry. And here you can see what will be the, the main topics in this connection. And uh, I guess uh, here, uh, specialists, but nevertheless, one has to remind that really the neutron is a massive particle with distinct particle properties, but also wave properties. And in the magnetic field, we have a two-level system which we can adjust, and we describe everything by the quantum mechanics. And uh, you know also this cartoon from 44, before interferometry comes uh, to work. And in the meantime, also in the New Yorker, there's another cartoon where a classical explanation is, uh, is given by these uh, skiers, yes. So, <laughs> but what we are doing is, uh, is interferometry, and that means that we use the wave picture. We have a perfect silicon crystal, and an incident beam is by Bragg diffraction split into two beams. It's reflected and superposed here. And when we introduce a phase shift index of refraction given by the coherent scattering lengths and density and so on, we, and we rotate that, for instance, we can get a nearly perfect interference pattern as it is shown here. And I think I have not to mention and that we are in the self-interference region. That means at the time there is only one neutron in the apparatus. The next one is still not existing. It is still in the fuel of the reactor. The phase density is very slow. Advantages probably are that the efficiency of the detectors, polarizers, and spin flippers are rather high. And uh, so we are dealing with experiments where we really see this particle wave duality before particle, uh, afterwards, and in between the wave features. And uh, here we see different interferometers which we used. And uh, for instance, only to explain uh, here that the intensity behind comes from a transmitted <laughs> beam reflected and reflected here, reflected, reflected, transmitted, and they are equal in phase and amplitude, and therefore we see this interference pattern. Most experiments we are doing <coughs> at the uh, uh, Institute Lau et Langemin in Grenoble, where we get neutrons from the reactor, a monochromator uh, reflects neutrons here to the interferometer uh, setup that is shown here, optical bench and things like that, and also uh, somehow here looks uh, rather similar to optical arrangements. And here I show you an interference pattern, quite some interferences, and then you see the envelope uh, is the coherence function, so we can measure them uh, rather accurately now, no problem. But nevertheless, I want to remind you that the first experiments or results we got in 74 in Vienna, which is a really student setup, I guess you can imagine, and the interference fringes were not so clear, but that was done at a very low power reactor of only 250 kilowatt, but I think it was quite clear that that exists. And, uh, okay, uh, yeah, not only to show that uh, students on work. I think m m most debated are this 4 pi uh, symmetry measurement with the magnetic field. In the same time, also Sam Werner uh, uh, and his, uh, the group uh, did it more, uh, simultaneously, and that showed that for a 2 pi rotation, there's a minus 1 in front of the wave function, and that becomes visible in this kind of experiments. And there is also, I think, quite 
often mentioned, uh, the St. Werner experiments on gravity and uh, on the usual gravity and on Earth's rotation effect that gives you all these uh, formulas. I think that's a classically. And uh, here, this Sagnac effect, when you rotate the, uh, the interferometer around the vertical axis, you see west, north, south, and so on. I guess you have somehow seen these results. Where it is all collected in this book, and so I can step immediately to more recent uh, <coughs> uh, developments, what uh, is done uh, now. And first of all, a few comments to non-classical states that only to mention that, that in the usual interferences at high order, the interferences disappear. <laughs> and that means that the wave packets separate. We get Schrodinger cat-like states, as is indicated here. And at the same time, you see here, a modulation of the momentum distribution is expected. So the situation here is not an incoherent one. It's still a coherent one, uh, a superposition of Schrodinger cat-like state, like it is indicated here. So we delay one leg quite a lot. And the neutron now occupies both spatial region at the same time. And these states can be investigated <coughs> most clearly. They are depicted uh, by means of the Wigner function. Uh, you see it here for such a state. Uh, here the, the Wigner function and the momentum mod modulation. Only I want to show you that that can be also really measured. We have a double loop interferometer producing the Schrodinger cat-like state by the thick phase shift in the first loop and analyzing them in the second loop. And here we have a momentum measurement in parallel of the uh, opposite momentum. And uh, you see here this modulation. It's not very pronounced, but it's visible. And here you see the double hump, hump wave function uh, in form of this Schrodinger cat. So this, uh, <clears throat> these states can be analyzed and uh, can be used. Now, one experiment which uh, still uh, is under investigation is to have neutrons in a confinement, or neutrons in a very narrow slit. Now, uh, how they behave. Uh, there are some proposals, Levi LeBlanc, Greenberger, uh, and uh, so we have here a potential uh, and neutrons going through, and they become quantized in the transversal direction, and that causes a, a, cha a phase change, very simple, uh, written down here, and then uh, can that be measured? You see, that is an effect which is somehow uh, different to that what is known for atom. In case you have a Cas Casimir force or you have a Van der Waals force, here uh, this quantization is purely due to the quantum state within uh, this confinement. And what is expected here, I have uh, that's calculated and is shown here for about 20 micrometer slit. And uh, so, you, but anyway, the problem is, and that's the difference to the proposal in experiment, one does not have plane waves. So you, you have always a certain divergence, and that causes that the excitations of the level is different. That means the parallel components excite these states, and the slightly divergent component excite higher states, and all that has to be taken. Now, you see how the experiment is done. There are waves, silicon wafers and they are put into the interferometer from one side to the other. <coughs> and, and what can be seen, it is uh, not an easy experiment. 
uh, because now you see here the original contrast, and the contrast is strongly reduced because only those neutrons which classically do not touch the wall contribute, and the shift has to be uh, measured. And here are the results. Uh, what um, uh, certainly, uh, I guess, is shown that the effect exists, but surprisingly, uh, we repeated the measurement, and in the experiment, we always got a higher value than the theoretical one. So there is still a question mark uh, to be made. Uh, we do not really know because we can, cannot find an effect which can increase the phase shift. Reduce the phase shift is no problem. But anyway, so that is typically. Now let me make a few comments to some to those measurements which concern with decoherencing or defacing. Usually we apply a noise field in one or in the other beam part, and then you see uh, that uh, the contrast is reduced. That's are the full lines compared to the dashed lines here, and that is the same in both. But it is more or less a defacing. Uh, because when we apply the same noise field into both uh, beam parts, we restore, retrieve the, the contrast. Now, that can be also done not only in the interference pattern, but also in the momentum modulation case. You see here uh, the dashed uh, <coughs> curve, uh, uh, the undisturbed. Um, modulation and then the smearing effect due to the noise field. And all together, we use different frequency bands and things like that. Uh, only what I need here is to say that when the interaction gets stronger, the contrast uh, becomes stronger, uh, reduced. So the effect increases with the increasing strength of uh, the action of the noise field. I think everybody <coughs> can easily understand that, but we will see that has some interesting consequences. Especially when we look to geometrical phases. No, that the geometrical phases, very phase and whatever, I think you know that, that there is a dynamical phase which is dependent on the energy states uh, of uh, what we, we deal with. And there is the geometric phase, which is half the opening angle of this excursion on the Bloch sphere as it is shown here. And I think uh, Barry brought that, we made that very clear. Uh, and uh, so many measurements exist in this case. But that was, has been generalized, uh, as it is shown here, uh, for non-adiabatic evolution, non-adiabatic and non-cyclic non evolution. And certainly there are more authors to be mentioned, but I think uh, we've just taken reference to them in, a, in that paper. And now you see with the neutron interferometer, it is feasible to make any arbitrary excursion on uh, evolution on a, a Bloch sphere. Here, for instance, we do it non-adiabatic, non-cyclic. We rotate the state uh, from one beam path to the other by this phase shifter. And then we introduce an absorber, so we come up to this point. Then we rotate this phase shifter, and by this geodesis, geodesis we go back to this point. And the enclosed area here gives you this non-adiabatic, non-cyclic phase. And <coughs> we compensate the dynamical phase can be shown well, by such a phase shift with different thicknesses. And when that is in combination with the transmission of this absorber, then you, you see the dynamical phase is zero. And uh, the results show this non-adiabatic, non-cyclic phase. And there are many possibilities of making such uh, uh, curious uh, excursions on the Poincaré sphere. So all these geometrical phases, topological phases, become measurable. And now 
in the literature, we noticed a paper or two papers mentioned here, which state that the geometrical phase should be more stable against fluctuations than the dynamical phase. That means uh, this uh, variation, uh, when, when we have uh, such uh, evaluation on the Bloch sphere, Poincaré sphere, with some wiggles on it, and so on, they showed, that they showed that the error in the geometrical phases decreases when the system is exposed for a longer time for such a noise, to such a noisy field that somehow probably, for, at least for the first term, uh, surprising uh, because it's opposite to the dynamical uh, case. So therefore, we tried to me measure that, and we did that with ultra-cold neutrons. So that's not with the interferometer. Ultra-cold neutrons are with an uh, energy, rather low energy, millik, and that can be bottled uh, in any material or magnetic bottle. And uh, they are available also at the high flux reactor at Grenoble. Have a look to that when you have not been there. Uh, here is a look to the reactor, and there they uh, extract uh, very cold neutrons. They are slowed down by a turbine with more, and then ultra cold neutrons come into the system. They are polarized by transmission of ferromagnetic foil, and then they, uh, they get uh, into, a into a trap, uh, material trap, which is a shutter, and uh, they are polarized here, and one can apply a magnetic field and rotate this field uh, in, to any directions, and the neutron follow them, and after some time, they are released, and uh, polarization is analyzed to here, to this detector. So, the turbine slows them down. Actively, or just no, this is, uh, this is act, uh, actively, yes, so it, it moves, and uh, yes, uh, there is phase, uh, the phase space is the same, but it uh, gets slower. Yes, the dentist. Here is the turbine wheel. Yes, and so they are coming out here. Yes. Okay. Now uh, the setup again. Here you see that the UCNs are uh, first of all they are from the neutron guide. They are coming here. Then they uh, come to this uh, trap. And here you see the magnetic fields which can be rotated. Everything has to be shielded as it is shown here. And here you see Stefan Phillips with it, uh, most of the work, and that works very well. And uh, so, um, so the first uh, thing was to measure the, uh, the geometric phase. And by means of that, it was uh, possible in very high accuracy. And you see uh, what is done. First, one rotates the spin uh, in the upper half of the sphere, and then applying a pi uh, pulse and rotating it in the opposite sphere in the other direction, and that cancels completely the dynamical phase. Yes, that is shown here that it really can be achieved. And now when you rotate that on different heights of uh, the spheres, you see that the opening angle can be varied, as it is shown here, and the geometrical phase effect is shown here, and you see with a very high accuracy, you see 0.50, uh, you get here exclusively of the pure geometrical phase. But that is now uh, it's a measurement of the geometric phase, but what we are interested in was the, to measure the influence of fluctuations <coughs> or disturbances. And Excuse me, I, yes. did, I didn't get it. So, so to get the geometric phase, normally you take a B field and you go around. Yes. And adiabatically, the magnetic moment follows this. Yes. 
What was, sorry, what, that was not the dynamical phase. Uh, so that, uh, that uh, but, but you see, that would be the, uh, the this, uh, uh, dynamical phase, yes, when, uh, when, you, when you do that, uh, because um, uh, anyway, uh, you, you apply a magnetic field to the system, yes, and, and, and it depends. Uh, also, that has always a certain strength. Yes, but, uh, but you see what afterwards remains by the geometrical phase, yes, is that, uh, that only uh, when you rotate it at different heights of that, yes, then this opening angle is different, yeah. yes, yeah. and that gives you uh, this geometrical phase. But uh, anyway, the, the, is now we're using the same methods. It's it's a fa it, it's, it's a phase echo method. Yes, you, you see, and uh, so now you add some noise uh, during this excursion. Yes, uh, and so when you do that, uh, you use the same principle as uh, made before, and the results indeed show that uh, the, uh, the accuracy in the determination of the geometrical phase increases when you expose the neutron for a longer time to this noisy field. That becomes better defined. And so <laughs> we also tried, I think, <clears throat> try to make some understanding of that. And I guess one can understand it when one looks from above to the, uh, to, to the block sphere for a short time, uh, you have some rotation uh, around uh, this field, uh, uh, along this uh, field, and they are quite different, yes? And for a longer time, you see the average, so that the average here for a long time becomes much better defined than in the other case. So at least we tried to get some more or less physical understanding. And here we draw that uh, in the sense uh, of a computer uh, calculation, the dynamical phase, which is in, indeed the integral over dt. I think you see the errors become larger. Whereas for the geometrical phase, which is an integral over the omega, uh, these do not diverge in that sense. Yes, that is something uh, concerning this uh, phase. Marash, yes. Has anyone taken advantage of this clear observation to, to make an, a high precision measurement? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You, you see, I, I think it is mainly discussed in connection with quantum communications. Yes, that means uh, when, when you want to make quantum communication over big distances, some people, I, I'm not an expert in that field, but they believe that when one can use the geometrical phase instead uh, of the dynamical one, they are less sensitive to disturbances. Yes, that is somehow uh, uh, what may be behind uh, the... the or this is just a theory? <laughs> yeah, certainly, I think uh, <clears throat> at least the theoreticians who have proposed these, these, uh, these measurements and things like that, they write that that, that could be a way to overcome uh, the problems of, of uh, defacing uh, in, uh, in quantum communications. Uh, but certainly, I think what we could do here is only to show that the geometrical phase seems to be more stable against fluctuations than the dynamical one. Yes, so that, it, that would, uh, I would say that uh, in, in a moment as a statement. Whether that is valid in, in, in all domains, I cannot tell you, but I think the verification of this stability, and I must also say these calculations and also the experiments, therefore, have been done in the so-called adiabatic limit. That means uh, that the spin always follows the magnetic field, yes? And at high frequency, that would be not the case. So that would be another step, and probably that has to be investigated as well. 
Yes, so that is something which is not uh, very key. But in this case of this adiabatic <coughs> behavior, I guess it is verified. Let me now come, yes, to, uh, okay, yeah, is it, yes, I, no, no, it's okay, yes, a little bit long. Now, uh, you see, uh, I became, uh, become now to the uh, question of context duality and somehow to the kochen uh, system. Why we are going in these directions? Mainly because uh, all these people on quantum optics and so on are dealing with correlated photons, correlated atoms, and having these uh, EPR experiments and so on. So I guess in principle, we do not have easily an access to having coherent neutrons, uh, two coherent neutrons at a time. Uh, but uh, so during the discussion, we come to this uh, phenomenon of context duality, which means in our case, a coupling between internal degrees of freedom and external degrees of freedom of a system. And there we will see we get very similar or equal phenomena. Mainly involved is Yuji Hasegawa, you can see a Japanese, but he is for 14 years now in Vienna and somehow Viennaized, Vienna, Vienna, I think, yes. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I think you know this classical uh, EPR experiments with two photons and uh, measuring the spin state left and right and where you get this entangled state of two particles. And uh, you see, you can get the same formalism also when you use for the neutron the spin and the beam path in the interferometer. That is also a two-level system, and this two-level system, you can get this entangled state as it is written down here, and you see the equivalence. And then uh, you can make the same, the analog calculations, and uh, as he, in this case, a, the observable A and B are commutive observable, also the spin and the beam path are commutive observables. And because you have, the, I guess for me it's enough, uh, you have the same formalism, you get the same Bell inequalities uh, uh, as uh, widely known in many textbooks. But now we have as a variable uh, the spin part and the beam path uh, characterized by the phase shift. And uh, it's showing you again this equivalence. We have the Poincaré sphere where we can plot the spin uh, somewhere and the beam path where, uh, let's say, at the South Pole, we have beam, only beam path two, here only beam path one. In the, uh, on the equator, we have both beam paths and we have the typical interferometer <coughs> situation with the contrast. And now, how to achieve such an entangled state? That is uh, uh, how that uh, can be done. You see it here, we use polarized neutrons, that's easy to achieve. And then we go into the interferometer, we split the beam, and in one beam path, we rotate the spin from the spin up to the minus y direction, as it is shown here, and in this part to, to the plus y direction. So here we produce this entangled uh, state. How that can be achieved, that is here minus y and here plus y, that is when you rotate this mu metal sheet, yes, so that the thickness is slightly different, so the rotation angle inside is different, and so you can make that. And then uh, we apply the phase shifter as usual, and behind uh, it we have here the spin rotator where we can make the spin analysis. First of all, when we superpose this state and this state, we get here a spin here in the xz direction, 
dependent on, uh, on the phase shift uh, given here. And this one is analyzed by, <coughs> by this uh, analyzer system. And uh, so <coughs> what we get is, uh, yes, was a quite different, <laughs> difficult experiment a value, but it is evidently above two. The, the theoretical value is larger, but you see there are some, I will show you uh, some experimental problems, but uh, I guess nevertheless, it's a verification of uh, this uh, Bell inequality, and it has been also discussed in several papers and so on. We'll not go into that details. But I only want to show you, we are, uh, I think we did the, the error analysis very carefully, but nevertheless, it was just a little above uh, two. And the main reason is, was uh, that in our case, the detector efficiency and everything is very high, but uh, the mu metal, a spin rotator, there is always a problem uh, of the full magnetization and of the stray field. Yes, so therefore, that was one reason we wanted to improve these measurements. And in this connection, we decided not to use such a static flipper, but to use uh, high frequency Rabi flipper, as it is shown here, there is no material in the beam, but at the same time when we produce a spin flip, then we produce an energy transfer and that causes that then the spin uh, rotates behind the, uh, after superposition behind with the Lama frequency, even in a zero field. Yes, due to, to the energy transfer here. And, uh, and this translation, the, 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 that can be, uh, this rotation can be stopped by an additional coil with, with the half frequency or the half the energy change. And that produces a static polarization in one direction, again, depending on, uh, on the phase shift here. And so one can, uh, use this, uh, this setup uh, in the same way and with an additional advantage that we can make different energy, uh, uh, number of uh, spin rotations here, which is dependent on the energy transfer. So what uh, one can achieve is a triple entangled state between the original one, which comes by this beam part and is shown here, and uh, this part with the energy transfer, and we control the path by the phase shifter. We have the spin rotator, spin control, and the energy by the zero field precession. <coughs> which we apply. So only to show you again this, uh, uh, this experiment, there is an, a second coil also only used for a spatial uh, measurement of these matrices here. You see you have the spin, you have the beam path uh, in, in such a combination and that should be smaller, smaller than one. And you see we got here a, a value. <laughs> yes, well, okay, that value belongs to these numbers here um, that the, uh, <coughs> the, the uh, non contextuality or more classical view gives uh, for this uh, measured expectation values a value smaller than one. And quantum mechanically, Merman uh, defined that, uh, it gives a factor of four. So you see here is an even better distinction between quantum mechanical prediction and somehow a classical uh, picture of nature. And that can be measured with this apparatus. You see, it depends what, what is the interesting thing that these expectation values, the order of these matrices is important. You see here X component of the beam pass, X component of the spin, uh, X, X component uh, of uh, say, uh, 
uh, of, the, uh, of the energy, uh, and so on, and so on. And when these measurements are done, so then you get here this pattern. You see here you measure for different spin rotation angles. That is shown here. Here for different energy transfers, different frequencies and different magnetic fields as a function of, uh, of uh, the phase shifter. And then you have to take the values at, uh, at certain distinct values. These, these values are given here. And the, the, the phase shift has to be taken out of these uh, diagrams. And when you do that, you can measure this inequality is and here you see uh, what uh, has been achieved. I think there is no question that this value is above two, and uh, so uh, this uh, is, is an, uh, in, not only an indication, a verification uh, of uh, that several non-local non. -local, non uh, of, of several local and non-textuality uh, theories uh, can not describe these experiments. So you see that there is a correlation bit, uh, of the observables um, uh, in which context they are measured. That means the result uh, of a measurement uh, depends whether it has been measured previously, uh, 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 what was the value of a previously measured uh, quantity. I guess uh, that is something which can be done uh, and this contextuality and it's also uh, more or less spatial cases of the Cohen-Specker <coughs> theorem uh, there are uh, many possibilities uh, to exclude uh, theories uh, or to verify them, so that is possible. It's surprising that in the meantime, yes, I'm just in time, I guess. Uh, I only want to tell you that, in, uh, that now there are some measurements with, uh, in Sweden with single, uh, with single photons in, along these lines. And our, also our colleagues in Innsbruck uh, did measurements which uh, also test of quantum uh, contextuality and probably uh, in the meantime several others uh, did uh, such uh, types of experiments. Let me make a sh short resume, which is not complete, and I think theoreticians may, cause, may do that much better. That is old statements from known people, I think. Uh, but the non-locality and wave particle duality appears in these experiments, which are meta-wave uh, interference experiments very clearly. And you see we, uh, the neutron goes through two different beam paths. Uh, you cannot ask through which one we know, but, uh, yeah, but you can ask it. You will not get an answer. That's the question. Uh, and, but we, uh, we would make the statements there is well-defined, naturally, there is no well-defined between quantum and the classical world. So you can go step by step, uh, shift this limit, non-locality, context, fundamental properties. Uh, correct description, uh, but anyway, one has to be aware that the boundary condition has to be taken into account. That is sometimes, sometimes forgotten. I think uh, I like also the statement of uh, Stanholm to some sense that, uh, yes, we should, uh, anyway, this, but uh, anyway, we do not know everything at the beginning, at the entrance of the experiment. So we should be not uh, so sad that we also do not know everything at the outcome, some statistics, yes? Because at the entrance, we have also a certain divergent beam and, and things like that all the time. And uh, another statement I wanted to make again, uh, that uh, when you carefully look to all the things, then you can get the impression 
and the fact that uh, the quantum mechanics gives you stronger correlation than classical mechanics because all these uh, EPR phenomena that do not exist in classical mechanics. So I think we should not think always uh, quantum mechanics is statistically and, and, uh, and arbitrarily. I think they, they show when you look at accurate, stronger correlations, and that is important for forming molecules, organic materials, and so on. Let me only come to the end uh, to show you the cooperators for over several gener uh, generations. Uh, there are always quite some young people involved and uh, that is also very important uh, and very motivating uh, for doing such experiments and, and with that we hope to have contributed somehow uh, to this uh, field of meta-wave interferences, and I guess you will hear more from some Werner's talk about topological phenomena and things like that. And in this sense, I want to thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To show a violation of Bell's inequalities, what visibility is required? Yes, yes, that <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I can show it in, in quite in some detail because when I was at NIST with Sam Werner, we just discussed that mainly. <laughs> that is, and you see uh, here we have a very high uh, efficiency of the detectors and so on, so that does not give us uh, the limitations in the experiment, but mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I show you. Yes, that is the setup we know, and um, you see, and here first of all, we have uh, the uh, the features of the apparatus, and that was what that was the, the challenge. That first of all, we have to have a very high contrast above ninety one percent was very important. And the spin rotation efficiency is even better, uh, 95%. So that, that more or less is, is our important features. But now, uh, when we could go through the whole experiment with this parameter, we would have seen a much higher violation. But that was not the case, and, uh, and so because one has to, because in the real experiment you see that the contrast is quite considerably reduced. Yes, and so these numbers are absolutely necessary in order to achieve values uh, where it's possible, and therefore the data analysis what was quite important. But you see, the main reason is why in this case the contrast is so reduced is mainly due to the spin rotator. Because let's say when you have here the mu metal, yeah, you can magnetize it completely. Yes, so then it's quite clear. But when you magnetize it quite uh, strongly, then you have stray fields. And when you do it not, very strong, you have uh, residual domains in it. So that, that limits uh, these uh, things. But as, as I said, therefore, uh, later on, we change this rotator to the other one but in, in order to achieve this value. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Danny? Uh -huh. yeah. uh, for a comment and, and a question. The comment is, that one always sees in two particle experiments that the quantum mechanics is always more highly correlated than the classical physics. But in three particles or, or more, when we were first fiddling around, I was struck by the fact that 
there are states where the quantum mechanical case is less correlated mm -hmm. than the classical, and uh, I, one has never figured out how to do experiments along that line, uh -huh. and, uh -huh. and uh, people don't think about it. But but there are regions where that statement is also true, and I, I think it's a, a profound mm -hmm. fact, but uh, it's, it has never been investigated. Uh, the, the question is, uh, when you talk about the confined, uh, the, have you published those results? That's true. Yeah. Well, can you give us a reference? Yes, that's in, that is in nature. Yes, I have it also in this paper. Uh, not <laughs> that's, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Must be, yes, here, here, and here. Danny commented in he did not Yes, here. He didn't understand. Here he is. I pointed out his name was up there. It's the proposal of his yeah. Here is it. Uh, in nature, <laughs> they do. Uh, but also do your first comment. Um, I think that's very interesting. We would like to know, yes, about these strengths of these correlations. Because, you see, when, when we now go into the energy domain, we are not restricted to, uh, to uh, this one, uh, this two-level system, but we can also produce more levels. So we can also have a, a fourth-fold uh, entanglement and things like that. When that is meaningful and when there is some theoretical background to do it, it would be of great interest to us, yes? Yeah, the fact is, though, that Greenberger did suggest that yeah. the confinement yeah. experiment, independent yes. of what he said. Yes. Yeah, independently, yeah. Well, if I had understood it, it, I wouldn't have published it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which one? <laughs> that is, yes. He's the correct. We'll leave that and have the, go back and have the reference. Yeah, go ahead. Next question. Okay, so um, one of the remaining uh, loopholes in all current uh, uh, tests of Bell inequalities using massive particles is the separability loophole. That is uh, being able to make uh, measurements of, um, say, spin, for example, um, at space-like uh, separations. In your uh, two-space Bell state experiments, can you make uh, neutron spin measurements at space-like separations? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I know, we have, but you see, in this kind of experiments, we do not deal with locality problem. It, 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 this, um, uh, what is measured here in the contextuality experiments, it has, has nothing to do with the question of locality and non-locality of that. So it is more, I, I understand it a little bit, it is a question which is, uh, in, in your case, there's the separation case in ordinary space. Here it is, but I'm not a theoretician, I guess, that is a phenomenon which is along the time axis. That means, let's say, the outcome of an observable which you measured on observable A depends on the outcome of a previous experiment made on the observable B. Yes? And uh, that, uh, that, that, that's the situation. So the question is somehow different uh, because we are in another domain. Yes, I guess. But let us discuss. You referred to Merman inequality, yeah. right, which you said was an um, example of, OK, uh, uh, local non-contextual hidden variables theory, yeah. right, uh, makes different prediction right. from yes. quantum mechanics, right. So to test something like Merman's inequality, you have to um, implement the locality assumption in your experiment explicitly. Yes, yes, yes. So I think it is relevant, at least in that particular yeah. case. I, yes, I, I think, sure, sure, I guess that is Absolutely true, uh, but especially in the formalism. But uh, you see also from uh, Merman's uh, formalism, it is transferred uh, to other variables, not all, not to uh, spatial uh, uh, variables that you measure at A and at B, but you measure the matrices in different sequences. Yes? 
And uh, so at least you have the same formalism and, and you go into that. And that is more or less along the lines of the Cohen-Specker phenomenon uh, or features of quantum mechanics. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd like to uh, ask a question. And that is, um, I understand the kind of Zurich uh, decoherence in which some trace is left in the environment. And uh, I, I, I want you to just clearly distinguish between that kind of decoherence and the kind of decoherence that you talk about here with a classical field, and, and to address the question of whether the decoherence that you have is, uh, is solely due to technical limitations, or, or in what sense is it fundamental? Mm -hmm. Yes, that is, that is a very often discussed question also with George Schmidt, by the way. <laughs> anyway, uh, certainly uh, <clears throat> there is this general qu uh, question, which is also uh, in some book, whether, uh, whether decoherence as such exists or not. Because it's always the question where you take your boundaries and things like that. So uh, let's assume it exists. Uh, and uh, so uh, therefore, I, therefore, you see, I also like to, man to say, uh, to, uh, to identify that more what we are doing with a defacing. Yes, not in this sense, uh, like uh, a decoherence where there is no reversal and things like that. But I guess in any case, you can uh, also in all other experiments, you can physically think uh, to reverse the experiment. So therefore, uh, one has to use uh, the, word, uh, the words uh, very carefully. But uh, where, where, for instance, those people are confronted in quantum mechanics when they uh, transmit information through the atmosphere and things like that. Yes, so that's atmospheric disturbances, and that's also macroscopic fields, more or less. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so uh, it relates to that, um, but it is uh, safer. Uh, to speak about defacing than about real decoherencing, because decoherencing, uh, when you could uh, really make it and describe it, is really the transition from quantum to classics. Okay. Yes, and I guess this border, this boundary, that can be always shifted. It's not defined so much. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, I was going to ask you something of a practical question. The, the last experiments that you were describing where you use uh, radio frequency fields to create the triple entanglement rather yeah. than the solid baton. Um, I infer from the slides that you were analyzing the effect of those fields in what one might call a, a rotating wave approximation where you, you are ignoring uh, a, a part of uh, uh, the, the radio frequency field that in old days might have been called the block secret effect. Yeah. Now, that's not a very important effect when one's measuring just the intensity of a resonance, a single resonance, but you've got these various entanglements where phases are important. Did you think about that? Is it important at all? What effect does it have? Yes, we know about the bloch siegert effect. We have not taken it into account here because we only used it uh, to rotate the spin and simultaneously to change the energy. And uh, in a separate experiment we did years ago, we really showed that then you get a, a state which uh, rotates with the lama frequency in a zero magnetic field. Yeah, so it's, and in the meantime, neutron people even use that uh, for spectrometry, yes, to have, uh, to have it. So that works uh, rather well. Uh, whether, um, yes, it's a good question, whether the bloch siegert effect may have some, it will not have um, an effect on the periodicity and things like that. But on the absolute value, it, it could have some, uh, some baseline or things like that. It has an effect on that you can't flip a neutron 
over with exactly 100% efficiency. Yeah, yeah. So the counter rotating part of the field yeah, always yeah. spoils that when the neutrons are coming in at all different phases. The counter rotating field must have something. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. We did some measurements as we done. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.